publicly yet. And uh, so we're going to have like probably two of those, just so you know. Is that okay? Can you pause like two of them? Two days. <laughs> and it is, and it is amazing, and it is amazing. Oh, it's tied. That's not going to work. All right. I like moving around. Anyways, thanks for coming to my talk, everybody. Um, really, this this bond. I think I, I heard Mick talk about a purple team a couple years ago, and um, you know, from there it started making a lot more sense. And you know, when I go into a corporation or go into a company, the same things continue to happen over and over again. Uh, we go and we blow stuff up, the next year we go, we blow stuff up, the next year we blow stuff up, and it doesn't get any better. And there's a reason for that, and there's a reason why it continues to keep happening. I'll talk a little bit about that as we, we go through, but the reason I, I started, you know, kind of bringing this message out there is to talk a little bit more about what we can do to work together from both de the defense and offense um, and kind of go through that. And um, in this presentation, I'm going to show you some, uh, the new version of SET, uh, which has a lot of new uh, evasion techniques as well as new attack vectors. Uh, version 6.0 is going to be coming out in hopefully about two weeks or so. Uh, so I'll show you some stuff with that, but I'm also going to show you how to defend against the attacks. Um, so how you can actually stop um, the SET attacks, which are really difficult to do, uh, but if you know actually how they operate and how they work in between, you'll, you'll be a little bit more successful. So just a quick intro, I'm a founder of TrustedSec. We're located about 20 minutes away from here, uh, just south of Cleveland in Strongsville. And i uh, been in the Cleveland area for a long time, and i presented at, I think, almost every Nauticon, if not all of them, maybe. I think every one. I don't know. Close to it. This might be the last one, so I hope not, but I hope to speak more. I was a chief security officer over at Diebold. Uh, I testified in, co uh, in front of Congress a couple times. You'll see some pictures throughout the, the presentation of some really angry people at me. Uh, I know that when you piss off Congress, it's usually a good thing, so I'm doing the right thing. Um, Co-founder of DerbyCon, a few other things with Adrian. Uh, deployed Iraq a couple times and uh, pissed off Congress thing. Anyways, so the concept is this, all right? Um, you know, when I, as a, as a red team person or someone that goes in and breaks into a corporation, you know, I find it easier and easier every single year. And it, it doesn't mean that, that companies aren't getting better or they aren't putting more defensive capabilities in. It's just our techniques change so much faster than anything else out there. And, you know, as a blue team, you're like, hey, I got this SIM, I got this IPS, I got this IDS, I got application whitelisting, I got, you know, a program built around all this stuff, I got vulnerability management. And we're, you know, the red team is much more sexy. We have a lot more people in the field going against the offense side that we figure out things faster and we move faster. So you're still using this stuff over here and we're still now using this stuff over here. So, and it's not, it's not a matter of the blue team can't catch up. There's a lot of great things that you do to stop us. But, you know, we're always going to get in no matter what. There's always one thing that, that just got missed or wasn't identified or you had a business process that, that went outside of your normal process where, you know, something ends up happening and we break in. So it's really hard for the blue team to, to, to actually go and defend against a lot of these things. And so what we need today is a little bit more of a hybrid approach, which is working together around our techniques and what you're doing on the defense. I, we, I just did a um, pen test a little bit ago uh, with a really large financial institution. And we, we kind of simulated this. So, you know, when we went and did the offense, we were, the blue team was sitting right there with us saying, hey, what are you looking at? It wasn't covert. It was completely overt, which is the polar opposite of what we're taught. And from there, you know, we started learning things about each other. I'm like, well, I didn't know you could do that with this and this. And he's like, yeah, I didn't know you could do that. And at the end of the day, we found a whole bunch of things that we didn't know about each other that made it a lot stronger of, you know, for me to, one, attack, so now I know a lot better ways to attack and get around defense, <laughs> uh, which is what I always like to know. But on the defense side, what you can actually do to stop a lot of these. And a lot of these recommendations that you're going to see from when I show the attack versus what you, what you see on the defensive side are going to be things that I've learned, you know, doing the offensive side with someone on the defense. So let's talk about today. So I go in and I break into a corporation. Uh, we own some more stuff. We blow some more stuff up. And then we report on it. And you guys get a list of, you know, let's just say 50 or 100 findings. And then you, if you're on the blue team, you go and you fix those. And the next year we go and we do the exact same thing. We get in a different way, probably the same type of vulnerability. And then from there you fix those. And then the next year we do the exact same thing, right? Sound right? So again, we continue to go in. We blow up. And what I love um, is MSSPs. So you started, you know, as, as, a, as an industry, we really focused on monitoring detection, I would say, probably over the past five years. Right? Over the past five years, monitoring detection has been a really critical part of what we talk about for defense. And instead of, of building the, the detection capabilities inside and understanding what our assets are, we take a shortcut, which is going out to an MSSP and saying, hey, here you go, you know, please you know, detect all of our attacks even though you have no idea what our network looks like or what our assets look like, and all of a sudden you're supposed to defend against it. So when we go against MSSPs, it's usually pretty easy to get through. So for me personally, when I go in and I break into a corporation, pen testing isn't working. And the reason it isn't working isn't, isn't because we're not doing the offense or you're not doing the defense. It's just we're so disjoined together that when we go in and we break in, 
you know, you fix it and it's remedial and then you go back to your daily, your day to day activities, it doesn't necessarily work. So, you know, first thing that I do typically on an engagement, usually the first or second day, especially like an external or internal, I'm usually in and I already have access to everything. What's the next three days? I mean, know what the next three days that I'm doing typically, on, especially on site, what am I doing? I already have the report done. I'm writing new tools, right? I'm writing new exploit. And I can test it in your environment because I have a big environment, so it's awesome. <laughs> so now, now I get even more offensive capabilities to own you guys next year. Um, on, and, and, and then I release a new tool, like a new version of Rinium or SED or a new exploits or the Magic Unicorn or whatever I'm doing. So it's great for me. I, I love the current state that we're at, but I understand it's not fair. So the first two days that I go in, I break in. I'm good. I'm done. I got the report written usually by the, the mid of the third day. And then now I got two and a half days or so, if it's a week long engagement, of writing a cool new tool. It's great for me. I love it. So for me personally, we need to evolve. The red team needs to evolve. You know, I know getting DA is sexy and getting access to intellectual property and things like that is sexy, but it doesn't do anybody any good, especially the blue team side, to actually go and defend against this type of stuff. And so for us, in order for us to, to be able to defend, we have to combine the blue and red team together to make one. And I'll talk about that and I'll show some examples. But let's kind of go through the current life cycle of a pen test, if anybody's been through this. And it probably sounds familiar if you have. Or if you're on the offense, this is probably our life on a day-to-day a day -day basis. So we get assigned, that's, that's Congresswoman Edwards, she hates me. Hates. I, mean, I can't even explain how much she hates me. So uh, I put her in all my slides just to make sure she remembers. Somehow to get back to her. It's, it's Congress, right? Um, that's her yelling at me, actually, and that's not a joke. That's a picture of her yelling at me at the time. Um, but basically, you know, as a pen tester, I'm assigned to a corporation. And that corporation is, you know, it could be a small, you know, the medium-sized business. It could be a really large organization with a lot of assets. And I get my scope. I go through all the things. And, and, and the security team, you know, um, usually the defensive team um, is going more covert. They don't necessarily know when it's happening. They might know that we have to have a pen test on every year. They might know that it's during this window. But most of the time, they don't know what's happening. So I'm assigned to go in a break in, and you're supposed to have no idea that's going on, right? Does that sound about right? Because we're taught covert, right? Covert's the way to go because we always want to test our IR and instant response because it's the right thing to do, right? That's, yeah. Anyways. So attacks occur. Maybe we're picked up, maybe we're not. But typically, you know, um, we just ran into a customer recently. Um, where they had really um, temperamental monitoring detection, but we had basically burner IP addresses of 1,500 of them that we just ran through and just scanned it until we found out what our threshold was, and then we just lowered it, and then we went, went and attacked them normally. So, you know, we can figure out different thresholds of when we get detected and when we don't, but who cares, because we have burner IP addresses coming from China and Russia and everywhere else, so it doesn't make a difference. Um, and then all we need to do is find one flaw, some really critical flaw that allows us access into the infrastru infrastructure. Whether it's SQL injection or phishing or, you know, RFIs or LFIs, it doesn't make a difference as long as we find that one little tiny thing that we care about. And once we have that, we get access to sets of data. From there, we do post-exploitation and gain access to everything else. And then we compromise you and then you have no idea afterwards, right? The blue team, you guys are working on 10 million different projects. You have the SIM, you have, you know, everything else that you've purchased in the past, you know, five years. You have a bunch of different other things. You're dealing with different business units. You're probably in meetings after meetings after meetings talking about how you're going to fix the findings for another finding down the road for another meeting that you're going to have later on. So you have all of these things going on at the exact same time. And so you're supposed to find us during that entire thing? I don't think so. It's not going to happen. It's unfair. And you know, what's funny with me is um, technology. So if you look at, I guess, 10 years ago, what did we have for our defenses 10 years ago? Firewall, Firewall right? That hasn't changed, right? We still have firewalls. What else do we have? AV's changed a bit because it sucks, but I mean, other than that, I mean, right? But firewalls were the core of our infrastructure, right? And what were we taught in the like, mid to late 90s, early 2000s with our firewalls? Anybody know? Protect the perimeter. Protect the perimeter, right? Ingress, egress. You know, making our, our internal network segment, uh, segmented based on resources. Have we done any of that? Maybe ingress and egress to an extent. Do we segment our infrastructure, our network? Do we know where our assets are in our environment? No. So you go and you, 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 you have an ASA you know, that, that isn't cutting anymore because you need to, you, you know, you need to move to a Palo Alto because Palo Altos are going to solve all of your issues that you didn't have with ASAs, right? And even though you don't understand your environment at all whatsoever, you're going to slap that thing out, you're going to put a new piece of technology and that's going to hopefully do something, that's going to detect something a little bit more. Again, you still don't understand your traffic, your data, where all of your assets are at, and somehow you're going to put a new piece of technology in. Now let me ask you a question. When you take an old piece of technology that you have institutional knowledge of that you've run for a number of years, and you put a new piece of technology in, what happens? Learning curve. Learning curve, exactly right. So now I'm learning this whole new piece of technology. What happens to all that old stuff? We forget about that, and we focus on our new, brand new Palo Alto infrastructure, right? And on top of that, every year we're buying something new. 
So it was funny, um, RSA, the keynote at RSA, was the CEO of RSA. He was talking about how, uh, how sims are dead, how you shouldn't worry about sims and you should throw the data out completely and just hit it with a hammer and that's it. And, and the whole um, focus was big data, big data, big data analytics. It's funny because RSA has no sim products, but they have a, a crap load of, of big data products. So let's go with that and that's going to drive the industry for the next two years. So now we're going to be buying big data analytics products for the next couple of years. Now what happens when we buy those pieces of technology? All the other stuff that we invested in the past two years now starts to go to the wayside, right? So now we're not focusing on all the other shit that we bought a while ago. We're now focusing just on this new piece of technology. So does anybody here have enough people in, in, in their team? Is anybody not overworked on their security team? Because if you are, I want to learn your secret because I don't understand it. We don't have enough people, we don't have enough money, but yet we still have enough money to go buy a piece of technology that's going to somehow solve our issues and from there we don't have anything else, right? So it's great. So the boot team, I, I, I feel for you. You know, you have an unaccomplishable, unaccomplishable job in your environment. In, in today's environment, it's not possible for the blue team to effect or even stop attacks if it's targeted. You will not stop me. If I sit there and I focus on you for enough time, give enough time, it's great. So again, in order for us to evolve, we need to, to work together to kind of create a cohesive team with the red and the blue team. And I'll talk about that and I'll show you some, some cool examples. So introducing the purple team, if you haven't heard it before, Nick's got a great couple presentations on it as well. Uh, but for me, you know, I look at change in a different way. Um, change is a way for, for us to do something different. Does anybody know the definition of insanity? There's two definitions, right? The first is what? Doing the same thing over and over again. The second thing is InfoSec, right? <laughs> it's in Webster's. Look it up. It's in there. The thing is, we're doing the same things that we've been doing for the past 20 years. We haven't changed. It's just the technology has a little bit. You know, my techniques as a, as a, as a red team person, has it changed that much? No? We still find MS-0867 on environments. We still find RPC and SMB exposed on the outside. FTP, you know, SQL injection. SQL injection is what, 14 years old now or something like that? Buffer overflow is a much longer uh, period of time. These are things that, that we've known for a long time. My techniques haven't changed. Like, does anybody know the number one way that I break into a corporation? It's not social engineering. What's the number one way that I break into corporations? What's that? Well, I didn't hear that. An old modem. That's actually a good one too. Uh, not the most one though. What's the, what's the most common way that I break in as an attacker? Dictionary, Dictionary passwords. passwords. Your shitty passwords. Sorry for the language, I apologize, but I had to kind of throw that out there. It's your default passwords that still get me in. Some weak SQL account or some weak user account and you still have null sessions on your domain controllers, which is ridiculous because that was like an attack from 2000. But regardless, it doesn't make a difference. Those things are still work for me today. It's the same thing I was doing 10 years ago. So I don't have to elevate my attacks. I might have to you know, do some evasion to get around your application whitelisting or something like that, but my techniques haven't changed. You know, the post-exploitation stuff hasn't changed. I mean, come on, I've been doing Kerberos and personization since it came out in incognito, you know, five years ago, right? Or, or stealing hashes and pass the hash. And even in 2008 or 2012 environments, things haven't changed, default passwords, et cetera. So it goes on. So the purple team's a combination of both defensive and offensive. Now, there's a lot of ways to structure this, and I'll talk about that. But for me personally, having somebody that just focuses on doing pen testing or red teaming, and having folks that just focus on defense and work together is a great thing. And does anybody know why, by the way? Um, well, let me take a step back. How many niches do we have in InfoSec right now? Thousands? We have people that, that specialize in firewalls, people that specialize in incident response, people that specialize in reverse engineering. And reverse engineering, you break down in a whole bunch of other categories, mobile application reverse engineering versus you know, you know, software reverse engineering or OSX uh, reverse engineering or exploit development. Then you got guys like me, the red team guys, right? Red team guys focus on application security, network security. You know, we have all of these specializations, and then the, the blue team guys, firewalls, sims, vulnerability management. You might, you might be a master at Nexpos, or you might be a master at Nessus, or a master at Qualys. You know, but you also have to be a master at a whole bunch of other things. See, we have all these specializations. So it's not, it's not good for us to have somebody that's just sitting in the middle that's red and blue. At least I don't think so. Because there's so much niche that goes into being a red team person, there's also a huge niche that goes into being a blue team person, but you work together to focus on something and that, that creates a pretty good cohesive effort to work together. So I think both working together on a red team and understanding what a, what a red team looks like. And hey, take them on a physical one time and show them how you're breaking into the building, the physical security people. That's a great thing. They don't think that way. They don't think that, hey, someone's actually going to break into my building or, you know, what Nickerson did to us when I worked at, at the Fortune 1000 company where he, you know, pries the door open a little bit and he takes a, a, a small piece of iron and runs it through the door so they can get a, a little bit of a static electricity to open the door. You know, people don't think like that. And I didn't either until I sat with Chris. So, you know, things that you do that are different to figure things out. 
And, and right now we're taught, and this is P-Test. I'm one of the founders of P-Test. In P-Test, we say covert is the best option. That's wrong. We're changing that. By the way, new release of P-Test coming out, uh, DerbyCon. But, uh, yeah, we're working on it. But basically, no covert pen test, period, for a number of years, until you're ready. Because right now, we don't have defensive capabilities. We don't have monitoring detection capabilities. And, let me, and, and, and I can prove it right here and right now, right, for a defensive. We might, we, might, 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 we might think we have monitoring detection capabilities, but let me, let me just throw this question out there. Who here knows everything that's going on in their company? From a technology perspective, just technology. Who knows what every business process is doing or what business owner is doing on application development? Is everybody embedded in a procurement and you know everything that goes through or that, that credit card that gets leaked through through your corporate environments? No? Yeah, me neither. I didn't either. So, so you, does anybody everybody know what IT products are going on, every single one of them? Is everybody embedded in those in a very good way? Again, we have so much stuff happening so fast, it's not necessarily possible to go through and do those. So, again, we don't have defensive capabilities because we don't even understand our environment. So let's fir first take a step back and say, okay, well, if we don't have detection capabilities and we don't understand what the offense does, does it make sense to do covert pen testing where we're just going to fail anyway? So ditch covert for the next five years. It just goes strictly over when you're doing pen testing. I was wrong. I thought covert was a great way of testing incident response. It's not. And so the purpose isn't just saying, okay, what flaw do we have here? What flaw do we have here? Can everybody hear me okay without the microphone? All right. No, it's still recording. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Can you pause it real quick? No, it's okay. Um, is, no, it's all right. I just wish I could walk with it. It's got tape everywhere, though. Anyways. Uh, Dave's going to fix it. It's got tape everywhere. Oh, you got one of these? When did you tell me this earlier? You didn't ask. <laughs> isn't, that what, isn't that part of your talk about asking? Test, test. Can you hear me? Okay. I know. Jeez. All right. That's, that's much better. Wow. It's amazing. Technology. New piece of technology, right? Um, so the, the purpose of a pen test isn't to find what vulnerabilities are out there. It's not to say, okay, you know, we have this SQL injection vulnerability, we have this out there. I know it, it sounds like it should be, um, and that's important to find those things, but the purpose is understanding how an attack goes from an entire life cycle. This is the penetration testing ex execution standard. And for me, if I can start to, you know, understand from an intelligence gathering perspective, do we have an over-absorbent amount of information out there? Or abundant, sorry. Do we have a lot of information when it comes to vulnerability analysis and what things we have exposed outside? Can I start to detect things throughout the whole life cycle of an attack? And that's where I think, you know, understanding how the offense goes about it, you know, whether it's going through FOCA or, you know, looking through Recon NG or finding information that's out there, you know, metadata, things like that that can, we can start doing from an intelligence gathering or OSINT perspective. You know, can we start, you know, removing a lot of this information out there so that people on LinkedIn don't say, hey, I've been working on this, this ArcSight implementation for two years. I mean, people post the most crazy amount of information out there. Like, you have salespeople that are saying, hey, I just got a brand new customer. We're going to be doing a FireEye implementation for the next, you know, two years. Great. Now I know you have no perimeter security, so I'm going to go right after you. You know, or hey, we're, we're just getting into Symantec. Okay, so I know you're phasing out McAfee, all right? You know, so there's a lot of great things I could find just for doing stupid stuff on LinkedIn. So do we, what type of information is out there? You know, what can we look for? Can I grab all your defenses? Now, as a blue team member, someone that's on the blue team defending, wouldn't that be nice to know if you didn't have any of that out there? Yeah. Now if I start going in attack, I start looking at different attacks, like uh, the vulnerability analysis phase or looking at uh, actual exploitation. You know, can I s eliminate a lot of the noise? Just as an example, this is stupid stuff that we should be stopping right now, like this day right now. Like we shouldn't have any reason or excuse why we're not stopping these basics, basic things right now. Like for example, at Diebold, um, you know, if you touched us on anything other than 84, 43, 25, or 53, you got banned for six months. The number kept increasing. It started off for like two weeks because everybody was nervous, and then I went to six months, like two days later. But, um, but you know, if someone port scans us on something that's not there, who cares, right? Now I know there, there's someone trying to enumerate information about me. I really don't care about them, so I'm going to ban them, and I'm going to ban them for six months. If you touch me on any other port that I know that is valid, then who cares? I'm going to ban you. Same thing goes when you start getting into the web applications, like NIC2, WIC2, W3F, you know, stuff like that, Nessus. How do we not block basic Nessus scans? I mean, most of us get alerted nowadays, which is good. I guess if someone's like pointing a scanner with us, you know, like, you know, firing away. But that's not an attack. Stop the basic stuff. So let me throw something out there. If you can eliminate 95% of the noise or just 80% of the noise, would that make things a lot easier for you? Yeah? So if I'm an attacker and I get blocked, what am I going to do? Probably change IP addresses, get blocked again, then I'm going to get pissed off and stop for a while. Right? Or if I start building things up, and I start building things up, I start getting web application attacks, and you throw a SQL injection or cross-site scripting across one of the web applications, and you get blocked for six months. Would that eliminate a lot of your noise? So now I'm only focusing on 5% of what's really there. 
that's more manageable to me with what we have today than anything else. If I can just focus on that 5%, then I don't care. Now I can start looking at target attacks or things that I didn't know about or start focusing on mapping on my assets in the corporation that are important. How many people are blocking just this type of stuff here? So that's a problem. And it's not anything that you've been doing wrong, it's just, it's a problem. Eliminate the simple stuff that we're doing. Listen, for me, the first thing I do in every single pen test is I map and I enumerate services. I look at web applications. I grab, you know, what versions of, of you know, um, code that you're running. Are you running .NET or C Sharp or uh, PHP or Java? What is it? If I see PHP or classic ASP, I'm, I'm instantly going right after that. So cool, set up a couple honeypots that look like they're running PHP in your environment and see what happens. Now you got instant notification on an attacker. Great, right? The simple things that we can do just to make things su super simple to do. Now, I'm going to show you a couple of examples here. Now, um, this is going to be using set. I'm going to show you two of the attack vectors. The first you're probably well aware of, which is the Java applet attack. Uh, but the new version of the Java applet attack is much different than before. Um, before what would happen is basically we would compromise a machine and it would kind of just spray a bunch of attacks at it, looking for which one would be successful. And the attacks were successful against things like application whitelisting and things like that because we're using trusted processes. So we'd get around bit nines and all those other you know, things out there. This new version is a little bit different. Um, it actually profiles the operating system that we're working on and it selects um, successful exploitation methods based off of the operating system itself. So what it'll do is it'll infect via um, VBScript, uh, Excel documents, but it's, you already compromised them, so it's, it's going to be successful. Um, it'll also go through and attack them through um, PowerShell, through, um, and the very last one it'll do is it'll drop an executable. So it does multiple attack methods, and it actually de um, detects which ones are successful and which ones aren't, so it can fall back to multiple redundancy ones. So you will be successful. Now, what's interesting about Java is they've changed a little bit. Um, Java 7 update 36, maybe, I think it was. Um, they disallowed um, self-signed uh, Java applets, which is a great thing. I, you know, when I first started the Java applet attack like five years ago, um, and I got a number of cease and desist from Oracle, which is great. I just ignored them. I figured they'd, come, you know, whatever. Um, but what happened with that is you can literally sign anything you wanted to, the self-signed applet, and it would say, hey, it was signed by Google or whomever you wanted to. And they've since, you know, started to progressively, you know, whittle, whittle down the, um, the self-signed certificate. So you now need a, a, um, uh, a, an actual code signing certificate, which is great. Now, the, the, ba um, the, the bad part about code signing certificates is this. You can literally register a, a DBA or doing business as, which costs you 50 bucks, and then you can go buy a, a code signing certificate. So you can buy a DBA of whatever you want. I can be like, I'm doing, doing business as Oracle, this is super secure. Or I'm a goat. Whatever you want to do. You can, make, you can do, run a, uh, register a DBA doing whatever you want to and, and, and make it whatever you want to. So I, I, I have DBAs uh, as verified publisher. This applet is secure and awesome. Um, you know, please click this, it is safe. Um, or a lot of times, you know, what's, what's great is you can, you can actually register a DBA and get a code signing certificate in about three days' time. So if you're doing a pen test for a company, you know, you just go and you, you get a DBA and then all of a sudden you got a code signing certificate that's theirs. So it's like, you know, if I'm going after trusted sec, I'd be like, doing business as trusted sec security. Cool. It's a little bit different, but not the same, right? So you're good. So there's probably legal implications there, but I don't know. So this is the new version of the Social Engineer Toolkit. And uh, this is version 6 of May. Let the VM pop up real quick. Cool, here we go. And this is version 6. Again, it should be on about two weeks. Um, what's nice about this, and you'll see it, um, the effectiveness, I guess, in the, uh, the web jacking attack that I'm showing you a little bit. Uh, but uh, a guy named Darkos um, just did, committed a new um, attack factor into this, which is called the full screen attack. And, you know, browser exploitation has been an interesting one because it's not necessarily about uh, what we can do now with sandbox escapes or, you know, getting remote code execution. It's about what we can present to the end user that doesn't trigger uh, those browser, attack, uh, browser flaws. So um, this one that you're going to see here in a bit, um, you can amplify it using the full screen attack. And literally, full screen isn't, um, isn't actually recognized as being a malicious attack when it comes to, like, Chrome, Firefox, IE, et cetera. So you can literally um, control what size the screen is so you can do full screen which hides the URL and everything else. And then from there, you know, you basically exploit them based on browser type attacks. So there's a lot of different ways of going about it. And that's, that's the fun part, I guess, of browser exploitation. is isn't finding like a, a heap, you know, like a, um, a heap spray or anything like that or a heap flaw. It's really now about finding what you can do that's allowed within the specific browser that doesn't trigger their, their security settings, uh, which is really nice. So we do social engineering attacks. We're going to the website attack vector. <clears throat> We're going to do the Java applet attack. And we're going to clone a website. So same steps as before if you've seen this attack before.
Now, again, this method's a bit different. Um, now, what's nice about this um, is it's a little bit different here. Hang on, there we go. Oh, hang on, I forgot to do something. Ignore what I'm typing here. I've done this a few times. So what's different about this now is uh, a while back, and I might have presented this a while ago, but um, a while back what, what the AV vendors are doing is, and what they do with Metasploit and everything else is they basically download the code and they take it and they, they say, okay, well, I'm going to write signatures off of this because, you know, we, we can't detect anything, so we're going to try to detect, detect something that we know is static. So what I did is I wrote a, um, an engine that took me about a month to write. It's a completely polymorphic and dynamic uh, code generation engine for Java. And what it does is it completely obfuscates every, every part of it. There's not one static feature of the entire Java applet that is, that is static. So every, two, every uh, um, 30 minutes, a new uh, Java applet gets uploaded to GitHub that's completely polymorphic every single time. And they gave up after like the fourth try. So um, you don't have to worry about any of that stuff getting picked up, which is great. And then again, all of these attacks are going to circumvent things like application whitelisting. Uh, the new attack vector that's nice inside a set is this. Um, so next-gen firewalls will actually stop uh, uh, like a second stage or first stage of an interpreter shell. Uh, at least some of them do now. And what's nice about that is basically ne all next-gen firewalls are, are antivirus for the network. That's basically it. It's just signatures and other crap to call behavioral, but it's really static signatures, okay? And what you can do with that is what I do in set is I basically take a interpreter shell, which is, uh, you know, going to be static code, and I encapsulate that in, uh, with an AES-256 encrypted bubble inside a memory. And then I cover that over SSH, and then I tunnel it out HTTPS. So, and it's dynamic each time, and it's polymorphic, so it changes the pattern each time. So literally, I'm going over an HTTPS tunnel the entire time, but all that interpreter shell stuff is encrypted, which is great. Um, so it works well. I haven't seen anything get flagged on that. And um, if anything does, I'll just rewrite it and do something cooler. Um, but uh, right now, it gets around it. Now, what's funny about application whitelisting, which I never really understood, is anybody... You know, well, I won't ask any questions here, but um, application whitelisting never stood. Maybe someone else can explain this to me. So application whitelisting was the big buzz for, what, two or three years, a couple years ago? And so everybody invested in things like Bit9 and things like that. Um, there's AppLocker and things like that for uh, Windows. And with application whitelisting, the thing I couldn't understand is we're deploying it to what? Where do we put typically, where do we almost always put application whitelisting at? Where does it go? Where do we install it at? Desktops, right? The endpoints. So we're trying to protect the endpoints from malicious software from being installed, right? Or things that aren't trusted. So the way that application whitelisting works is you have a list of trusted processes, so IE, whatever, blah, 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 and then you got a bunch of stuff that you disallow that isn't known, right? So let me ask a question. If I'm going to exploit a endpoint, what am I going to exploit? Something that's already on the whitelist, right? I'm going to compromise IE, I'm going to compromise Java, I'm going to compromise whatever. Oh no, I can't install a binary. Guess what? We've been moving away from binaries for the past like three years. We don't drop binaries anymore. So we use like, things like PowerShell or you know, Excel, things that are amazing for us to use. Everything that you already have installed on your, on, your, on your PC is a great exploitation method for us. And guess what? We can get persistence and everything else without triggering application whitelisting, which is beautiful. So I never understood application whitelisting. It didn't change the way that we attack much, uh, but everybody invested in it, which was cool. It was good for us because everybody got rid of AV, which you know, it's hit, always hit or miss. Yeah, that's not it. Hang on. 45 and 76. All right, so I just cloned Tech. Looks like Trust Tech I never should perform. This is the new app, but again, um, you can name it whatever you want to. <laughs> I love goats. I don't know why. It's just weird. Like, I, we got a, we're building a new house in the middle of nowhere. I'm, I'm going to get, like, four goats. My wife doesn't know it yet. I'm just going to buy them and see what happens. Um, but you can name this whatever you want to. And typically, again, when we go after these type of things, um, we're going after an organization, so we'll name it the company name that we're going after. And the, the publisher is, is what you're doing business as. So, I, again, I own, like, six or seven different DBAs. Um, and, again, it's, like, a simple, like, $30 to $50, um, you know, registration fee. And then from there, buying the code sign certificate. Um, and then you register that, you hit run, and then, you know, you get access to everybody's machine. It's really hard. So we get shells over here. Again, my life is so sucky, it's horrible for us. Now, it's great, though. Um, we target people. I got another misconception, I guess, in the spear phishing side, right? Um, every company wants to do a sample size. Like, hey, we have to do a sample size of our population to get a true accuracy of how we would actually get fished, right? So, so your accuracy is going to be like, hey, we're going to send it to 300 people. That's the most horrible thing you can do, right? You only want to target, like, three people, max. That's it. And then you just wait. You just sit there and you chill. 
smoke a cigarette, grab a beer, you wait because you're going to get that one shell from that one person. And you, guess what? When, when you only target three people, what happens? No one says a word, right? Three people, you're not going to get detected. They're not going to be like, hey, this looks suspicious, security team. I need, you know, can you enact incident response? And you enter your incident response and you block the IP address, which, by the way, is also funny about IR, is uh, when we compromise your machines, what do we typically do? We have a shell that goes out to us, right? And you find that shell and you reverse engineer our stuff or whatever, and then you, you ban our IP addresses, right? What do I always do? Move them to another IP address so that when my IP address gets banned, I still have shells on the one IP address or 16 of them. You have scripts that go to 16 different ones. So we make it like, again, my job sucks. Your guys' job is much easier than mine. Um, so, you know, you have these, these interpreter shell, or you have an interpreter shell on there, and again, this is all evading um, application whitelisting, next gen firewall stuff. And uh, you can actually see a demo of this. I'll show you real time what this looks like. Uh, you should really see what WhatPass does. It's pretty cool. That's another time. So uh, I'll tell you a little bit about it. Can you pause it for a sec? <laughs> now this isn't my real password. I'm just putting that out there. It's just a, a temporary one. Oh, because to go change that now. <laughs> goat, 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 goat! Exclamation point! You guys got me. All right. Um. <laughs> All right, so what I'm doing here is I'm just going to pull a monitor for some time. And what I'm waiting for is an encrypted string that gets pulled from a dynamic cipher key uh, off of AES. And that's encapsulated over SSH. That's encapsulated basically over HTTP. So it's like three different you know, layers, I guess. And so we're just waiting here for this to kind of um, establish a connection over HTTP. Then it's basically going to decrypt that and then um, tunnel it over a tap interface over SSH, which is going to communicate back real time to the, the victim machine. So I'll go ahead and click on this real quick just as an example. And this is a demo. I mean, obviously, I've weaponized it in payload. Put it in memory without touching disk, all that good stuff. Um, so yeah, we should have shells running in a second. I go over here. Encrypt tunnel identified. Tunneling Metasploit. And you're going to see it's actually going to launch the um, interpreter payload through um, local host. So I'm actually tunneling through SSH over HTTP through the local host over to the victim, Oop, over to the victim machine. Almost bit it there. Now, what's funny about this attack is I never have to use this. I'm just waiting for like someone to stop like my, my normal stuff. Like, I don't have to worry about this yet, so it's just in the future. So I hope you guys get better because I want some cool shit to run. <laughs> so we get our shell over 127.001, but it's obviously I'm on my Windows machine here. So yeah, fun demo. Again, I really want to use this stuff. I have like a whole bunch of cool stuff that I've been wanting to use. Like. Like on a pen test, like, hey, I wrote this for your customers, which is really why I wrote it on the past customer because we broke in two days. But um, this is why it was one of the pro prodigies. Hey, I broke into a customer in two days, and now I wrote a, you know, a, a pretty cool thing in three days. So, anyways, um, I hope to be able to use it someday. So please get better because I want to be able to use it. <laughs> Next, we're going to do the web jacking attack. Now, what's fun that I know about you folks in the blue team, uh, or at least, at least, I guess, in your corporation is that you're going to be able to, uh, you're going to tell your users certain things that you don't want them to do, right? It's the whole education awareness program stuff. And folks that have a very mature education awareness program are in the same boat as folks that have an immature education awareness program. You use the same steps, it just might be more frequent. So what do we tell users not to do when they, when they get an email that has a link in it? Don't click is not obviously going to work because they click everything like eight times, but what do we tell them to do? Hover. The hover. I love the hover. The hover is my favorite now. I use that all the time. You don't even need to do on mouse over. Just wait till you see this. Oh, I did Gmail. I don't know what that is. <laughs> some, some goat stuff going on there. Uh, 
All right. So what this attack's going to do? Oop. Shit. Hit Apache up. Yeah, you know, I'm supposed to hit yes, but I hit YT instead. Did I hit Y7? Pay attention. That's good. Okay. So what I'll typically do with this um, is a lot of times, especially like around this time, uh, benefits are always great. And what's going on with the Affordable Health Care Act? No one knows what the hell's going on. So you can literally say whatever you want to about health care, and it's true. So you can be like, a new clause is passed, you know, congressional hearing. We have to set on a new privacy policy, and here you have to sign it. If you're really like, oh, crap, we've got to do this again? All right. So they go in, they click on it, or whatever. So you can do whatever you want to. But what's great is um, on, when, you're, when you're doing your perimeter attacks, you know, we do a lot of open source intelligence. A lot of times you can find what their benefit site is or the portal that they're going to be using for the benefit site. And so a lot of times I'll clone that. I'll make it look legitimate in nature. And obviously I'm stealing credentials and stuff like that. And oh, what's great too is uh, total fail on, on two-factor. So um, one of my favorite one, my implementations of two-factor is a company called Phone Factor. It got bought up by Microsoft. And uh, Phone Factor, what's, what's amazing with Phone Factor is this. So whenever you give the user the ability to mess up, what are they going to do? They're going to mess up no matter what. So what's happened on the past five pen tests that we've run into phone factor with? They mess up. So we'll fish them and we'll get their creds and then we'll go to log in. And then it says, it sits there and it says, wait while we contact you, right? So I sit there and I wait, just waiting. What happens? It logs me in. What happens? User gets a text message or a phone number or a phone call or whatever and it says, hey, are you trying to currently log into OWA or wherever you're trying to go to? What are they going to do? I, I must be somewhere. My, well, I think my computer at work might be. I'm just going to hit next. Okay, approve. That's worth the past five times on our pen test. And we've only ran into phone factor five times. So it's a good statistic. I mean, I don't know if anybody else is having it, but I mean, users are always messed up. But especially if you target like salespeople, amazing. Like you could actually call them on the phone and say, hey, we're doing some tests in the phone factor system. Can you just hit yes a whole bunch of times? Because we're going to send you like 10 of them. They're like, oh, yeah, cool, no problem. Sounds good. Awesome. You know, but what's funny is, like, I don't even have to call people. It's just they do it anyway, so it's great. <laughs> so what's great with this one is I'll, I'll send an email out. And again, a lot of times I'll throw, like, you know, exploits or things like that in there. But I, not actual exploits, because I don't tend to actually use real live exploits, because a lot of times they get picked up, or it's, you have to be very um, specific with them. But, uh, 167, that 176. So again, this is just a very basic example. What I would do is I'd pretty this website up to look legitimate, right? And in there, I'd say, listen, you know, you need to make sure that you're not being fished. We don't want you to be fished, okay? Can you please hover over the link to make sure, one, that it's HTTPS, because we only allow secure sites, and two, can you make sure that it's a domain that's trusted by you, okay? So for example, if I was going over a trusted sec, if I hover over the link and I saw benefits.trustedsec.com, would you trust that? Well, oh, you are now. You guys are a little, a little squirrely, but I mean, after that, you, before you would have. So you hover over that link, what does that say? Counts.google.com, do you trust that? Hell yeah, right? That's what our education awareness program tells us to, so we're going to do it. So again, this is just an example, but having a really nice, beautiful site here that looks legit in every way, shape, or form. And I click it. Now watch what happens really quick. Now, especially if I couple this with a full screen attack where you don't see the URL, there's nothing that you can see as completely transparent. So I'm going to click this link. You're actually going to be sitting physically on the accounts.google.com site real quick. We're going to do a quick switcheroo, all right? It's kind of a fun attack. Ready? Watch. I'm, I'm at accounts.google.com. Boom, switcheroo. Now I'm over here. Boom, credentials. <laughs> That's pretty messed up, huh? Yeah. I got the, and this isn't me that wrote this, by the way. I wrote the credential harvester piece, but uh, this is Mgent and uh, another guy, uh, White Sheep, that uh, wrote this part of, that used to be on the backtrack development team. So. Uh, kudos to them. That was pretty cool. But it's it's literally the most stupid, simple attack. It's just a it's an iframe reflection attack, and it's super easy to do. It works on all browsers. It works on Chrome. It works on Firefox. It works on IE. All up to date. It doesn't make a difference. So that's great. That one works for us all the time. So messed up. I feel bad for people. Oh, and then after that, it redirects back to the legitimate site, so they never knew that they're at the bad site. Just to make sure. Make, you know, not to overkill or anything. <laughs> It does not post back to the same site. Uh, that would be slick, and I've actually tried working on it, but it's extremely difficult to understand the logic of a post on a website. So what we can do is replay it and then pro hopefully post it back, but I don't have control of that browser at that time to post it. So, uh, you know, it could work, but it just takes a lot of customization. Now, what I'm going to do is, I, scenario one was a Java applet, right? And scenario two was the web jacking attack. 
I'm going to show you, a, a, I think, a multiple choice, right? And you pick which ones are going to be the best. You can, you, can, you, can do, you can say, you know, A, B, and C are good. Or you can say just D or all of the above, whatever you want, okay? But you, pick, you guys pick what's the best and gals. Which one's the best uh, for, for each one? So scenario one, the Java Apple attack. <laughs> Which one? I just... C, okay. C is correct. So is all the other ones, all right? No, for real. <laughs> it's one of the, one of the few, um, few uh, memes that I've actually made myself. The rest of them are stolen somewhere. Um, all those other ones, that, that, I mean, that was great. Anyways, no, for reals, how do you, how do you stop it? Is that? What's the, D is still correct. There's a few of them, all of the above. All right, so first one, disallow execution from temp. Now, this is a common place that most executables run, um, and especially running executables. Now, it's not going to stop me necessarily for the Java Apple attack, but it will stop the binary drop phase. Most malware actually drops in temp and executes from there. Your user should never be doing that. So disallow execution there. Now, by the way, if you don't have an application whitelisting tool, you know you have one for free in group policy. It's called App Locker or Software Restriction Policies. Those two you can configure right now that you have right available to you that you can disallow all those from executing. And you can only disallow those from um, or from non-administrators. So you can literally say, if I'm, not, if I'm, if I'm in a non-administrator, I can now, no longer um, execute in temp. All right, next is disallow execution from all users profile. Again, another one that's common malware drops. Um, disallow regular execution from PowerShell. That one right there is almost disastrous for me as an attacker. And by the way, you can do this in software restriction policies or app locker. So you can disallow PowerShell from never running from a normal user account. But to be honest with you, if you're not, if you're not actually, um, you know, if your user accounts are not actually running as AM, you're doing a good job, but most people still have your local users running as AM, and so you're basically screwed. Um, but if you, if you don't, if you actually have user accounts running as limited users, disallowing PowerShell execution for normal users in AppLocker is easy. It doesn't impact anything. And it stops a lot of the attacks that are coming out now, like power exploits uh, from Matthew Graeber and the folks over there. Um, the magic unicorn attack stuff that I did, the x86 downgrade stuff there, I'll talk about in a sec. Um, but basically, it stops a lot of them. Now, there's also a couple of things you can do around Java, too. Um, removing Java may not be necessarily feasible for your corporation. It doesn't happen for a lot of companies. You can't actually remove it. There's actually a cool thing you can do with like um, app virtualization, like App V or you know Citrix environments. What you can do is you can actually publish um, you know icons on your desktop that are like IE secure, and it's only whitelisted applications that you know use Java. And then you have another browser on your machine that's their local one that doesn't have Java installed, and now all of a sudden you know you have things that are for corporate use that you've whitelisted and things that aren't that don't have Java installed. Again, very easy way of, of mitigating that in an App V pool. Nothing's bulletproof. Of course, I broke all that stuff, um, but it's harder. Right, so um, one of the folks at uh, Paul.com wrote a thing about how to thwart client-side attacks, especially within set. Um, that was a, it was a great um, uh, uh, example of how you can do some things with software restriction policies. Again, this is how I learn stuff. Uh, but you can actually get around um, software restriction policies and, and, and uh, execution restriction policies with um, AppLocker using something like this. And this is just a quick point of uh, proof of concept. Most people will uh, put like a safe folder for them to run executables for the users. So this just enumerates every single directory and tries to run a small exe each time until it finds the right one and then it drops some malware. Just simple stuff. This is the magic unicorn attack. Um, so originally, um, Matthew Graber came out with an attack that basically allows you to take Metasploit shellcode or any shellcode and drop it into memory through PowerShell. So basically you grew the stack of PowerShell and you injected your malicious code in there and it never touched disk, which was phenomenal. Uh, I ran some restrictions on it because um, a lot of times I'm targeting different operating systems, like 64-bit or 32-bit, right? And so what I did is I figured out a way to take his code and shrink it down to the point of detecting specific attacks, uh, or uh, sorry, uh, specific platforms. So it'll automatically detect whether it's a 64-bit platform, and if it is, it'll automatically downgrade itself to an x86 process. So I only have to keep one piece of shellcode in there. It's much more smaller, which I can put on the command line. So I don't have to have two separate things of shellcode anymore, which is nice. And that's all on GitHub if you ever need it. So webjacking, how do you stop webjacking? <laughs> I, I struggle with that too, to be honest with you. I, I don't know. <laughs> no, there is a way. So some of these are more vague, and I'll talk about some other things to ponder here. Uh, but education awareness is still going to be key, right? I mean, looking at the URL that you're going to, stuff like that. But again, we're expecting a lot from our users, which, I mean, it would be like, I'm trying to put it in perspective of, like, when you join a company, what are things that you know that you have to do? Like filling out a pay stub or a check thing, right, so that you can get your, your, first, your first payment. Or HR, what's expected of you, right? I can't walk in naked. 
tried it, it doesn't go good, right? So you have that, and certain things that are expected of you. Do you are you a HR ninja? No, right? You don't know everything inside and out of, of HR, nor should anybody know everything inside and out of security. So it's certain things that we have to keep in balance there. Some technological controls. Now, by the way, if you're using something like WebSense or ScanSafe or something like that, there's actually a field in there called uncategorized. You can actually disallow uncategorized sets, which really won't impact you much anyway. Um, and you should definitely test it out. But most websites that are malicious are going to be uncategorized. You disallow that, and you're actually going to stop about 80% of your targeted attacks. Because most of the attackers don't actually register them. Now, again, to register them, you can actually, this is a funny one, it's a blue coat. Um, you can actually clone blue coat site and then submit it for approval as a legitimate site, and it'll actually whitelist you for categorization. It's cool, no big deal. Same thing for most of the other ones too. It's not just blue coat, it's all of them. Um, so, you know, getting categorized is, is just another step that we have to take as an attacker. Oh, you're supposed to guess though, sorry. So it's A, B, and C. Some things to ponder to do. Um, education awareness, two-factor authentication. Again, two-factor that's gonna be um, not easily broken by the end user. Like for example, I like um, uh, uh, Duo Security, but they have, a, they have the same thing, it's their Duo Push, which is the same thing, you can approve or deny. And you know, that's a good thing, but again, you put it back on the user. So we use the one-time pins on this. So basically I do a one-time pin, I actually have to copy and paste or type it in manually to get it over there to work. And that works because there's no other way for me to do it. Again, I can call the sales guy up and say, hey, what's your one-time pin? They're like, oh, it's 2727. Um, Up-to-date software, again, easy stuff, uncategorized sites, least restriction possible. Has anybody heard of the Enhanced Mitigation Experience Toolkit? If you haven't, download it right now, it's amazing. It's like the coolest thing that we'll ever, um, you'll ever do. It's called Emmet, it's free, it's from Microsoft. Um, it came out oh, like three or four years ago. Uh, but they're on version um, 4.1 right now. They did a pre-release of 5.0, it's coming out shortly. And what Emmet does is they've, they've essentially um, looked at how exploits work. So to get around certain protection mechanisms in Windows, like um, ASLR or address space layout randomization or data execution prevention or DAP, um, or a lot of the other protection mechanisms they have, I have to do certain things to remove those, res those restrictions. I can't execute assembly code in a um, stack that's marked, you know, no execute, right, or NX. So I have, to, I have to get ways around that, and I have to, you know, do a few things to to disallow those. Now, one of the techniques that is that is often used for data execution prevention uh, uh, maneuvers to get around it is a technique called return-oriented programming, or ROP. And what ROP does is it basically just uses a piece of code from over here, some code from over here, some code from over here, and assembles you to to you get what you want. And they do what are called returns to get back to your, the place that you're at. So that's why it's called return-oriented programming. What Emmet does is it actually looks at those. It says, hey, this is, this is, a, this is a ROP gadget, a ROP widget. Um, you know, we need to stop this. And so it actually stops zero days. Like, you know, um, it actually stops zero days that come out for IE, stops zero days that come out. Now, there's caveats to this. One, um, you know, there's a guy named uh, Jared DeMott, who's a good friend of mine. He actually showed a bunch of bypass techniques for it. So it is bypassable. But again, it's another step that you have to do on top of it. What's even better is there was a zero day that came out about three weeks ago that actually checked for the Emmet DLL. And if the DLL was there, it just shut itself down and wouldn't run. So, I mean, it's, it takes much more time and it's a lot more effort for us as an attacker to go through and bypass the mitigation techniques in Emmet. And again, it's free. And literally, the installation for this is so ridiculously hard. I mean, it, it, is, it is really complex. You, you double-click the MSI and you hit, like, next, 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 use recommended settings and finish and you're done. It's really bad, but I know, it's, I know we can overcome that. And this is what you get. You get this, like, nice GUI screen that tells you your protections. Again, difficult, I know. Now there is one customization that I do recommend. You click on apps in here, and there's a deep hook setting. You definitely want to click the deep hook setting. Um, that gives you a lot more protection, because uh, it's lower on the stack, harder to get to. So you learn some cool stuff, right? Hopefully, a couple of neat things, little tricks you can do. Um, but that's just, so, that's just two examples. You know, for me, and this is, I think, what I learned from Mick, is you know, the, the, the blue team hasn't been sexy in the past, right? Because you guys are doing monotonous tasks daily and daily, and it's easier for us to go and blow shit up and then leave. Like, we're the cool guys in the club, right? It's not. You guys, are, you guys get all the credit in the world. I mean, the amount of work that you have to go through and do is amazing. However, you know, if you come together and we, we look at the purple team, that to me is sexy. Come up with different ways to work together to figure out defensive capabilities, figure out offensive capabilities. I mean, I learn new ways of breaking into companies every single time I sit with them, which is a dangerous thing in itself. But um, the defensive people, at the same time, learn a lot how to, how to protect against and how I think. So working together is awesome. Um, if you look at education awareness, education awareness has always been focused on the end users, not on our people, like the technology, the InfoSec people. So let's figure out how I break in, how you defend, and work together. So that's, that's that. I kind of hit that with a 10-foot pole there. But, um, and it's not just 
you know, hey, I can run MS0 to 6 7 here's the Metasploit commands. It's the full life cycle of an attack. How do I think as an attacker? How do I harvest enough information to launch my attacks? How do I enumerate systems? How do I go after things in a way that, that you don't understand or you, uh, you're focused on other technology to do? And so, you know, <laughs> um, yeah. So, you know, if you look at, at each phase, you know, record it, document, and communicate it. I remember at Diebold, um, when we did our pen test, it wasn't with one company, it was with three. So we hired three independent companies to come and attack us. And what did I do when those three companies started their attacks? It was all different ones. So social engineering, um, website attack vectors, and physicals. Same exact time, right? What happened, does anybody know? So I was the CSO, right? I was supposed to be in charge of everything. What happened when those three were just kicking off? Anybody know what I did? Anybody heard the story before? What? I got on a plane for 14 hours to Europe, right? What does that do? Well, it makes me tired. I was, I was sleeping the whole time because I knew the whole, I knew everything was blowing up behind the scenes. But I had another job secure just in case. But uh, um, I also did it during a huge network migration. Worst time you could ever possibly do this type of attack. Like, very worst case. So, so a, lot of, a lot of things going on. But why did I do that? It's a worst case scenario. Like, what's going to happen? How can I respond to this? And guess what? They did a good job. Now, they didn't stop everything. There was flaws in what we did, but what did we learn? How to fix the flaws and how to respond to those things. And guess what? That was after a lot of maturity until we got to that point. I don't recommend that type of thing for a while. Plus, you've got to be really stable in your job because it really pissed a lot of people off. <laughs> so the way I look at this is levels of maturity. And, and what do you need to do to progress forward? And for me, that's, it's a very black and white thing. I think, you know, you look at convolution, I guess, in the security industry, and it's very, like, hypotheticals and risk equations and formulas and you know vulnerability management processes and all this magical stuff that's supposed to work together. However, it's still to me, when I look at it, I'm just like, wow, this is so complex, I don't understand it. And so the way I broke it down is in the six levels of maturity. And these are different things that you can do, just examples, but you know, build on those on your environments to do. So first level is what I call breach readiness level one. It sounded kind of cool. Um, the first thing is detect automated scans, uh, port scans, you know, vulnerability scans, NIC2, WIC2, W3F, et cetera. Before you can do any of that, you have to first baseline your perimeter. If you don't know what your assets are on your perimeter, then you're already failing, right? You need to know that, hey, I'm running all these ports here. Here's the services that are running. Here's the software that's running, and understand those. And after that, you can start putting in the automated to, uh, to block it. The way that we did it, and I can send you the, all the script if you're interested, um, Cisco's, um, especially ASAs, they, they, um, they send deny packets, right? So if I touch something on a port that isn't there, it sends a deny. So all we did was just filter through those logs and some centralized, like TACX or something like that. Um, and we'd go through, and uh, we'd automatically shun and block um, them globally across our board. It doesn't require a firewall will change, it's just a shun. And so basically, we got a, a deny pack, it would automatically shun the IP address, and then boom, you're done. You don't have to deal with it again. Um, very easy stuff. And then we started integrating like web application firewalls. I don't, I'm not a big fan of web application firewalls because I don't think they work very well. Uh, but from a detection perspective, if you can detect like basic script kitty stuff, like SQL injection and cross scripting and stuff like that, awesome, right? If I can detect that and I can automatically block it for six months, then I don't care. Again, I'm eliminating the noise. This is level one. This is the basic stuff. Now you start to profile your web applications to get your web applications under those control. I, I think it takes a little bit of time to get the web applications under wrap because you have so many of them now. We've all moved to that. Um, focus on egress filtering um, and allowed communications. Again, if I'm not able to get out of port, very easy for me to get out, um, access to the internet with. Level three, uh, make it difficult for pivoting on post exploitation phases. Like, just as stupid stuff. Like, when I break into a company and I get access to a box, that local admin hash is the same on all the other ones. That's ridiculous. So change them. Make them different in every single box or disable them completely. Do you really need a local admin ha uh, account enabled on that box? No. Then you get the excuses from the help desk, which is like, well, hey, you know, if it gets disjoined from the domain, I don't have the ability to rejoin it or troubleshoot it without, you know, that type of stuff. That's not true. You can reboot it in safe mode and automatically re-enables the administrator account. So you don't have to worry about that. So there are ways around that, all right? Making things easy. Now, also, did you know, in server 2008 and 2012, if you have that little great checkbox saying disable local admin uh, account, that it doesn't work? Did you know that? Did you ever test that? So 2008, the policy changed so that there has to be another local admin on that box in order for that account to be disabled. So if you don't have another local admin on that box, that account is still going to remain active. Yep. So there's ways of fixing that. Um, you can use um, scheduled tasks on the machine to run like every five minutes, just to disable it with the net stop command. Doesn't hurt performance. They'll never see it. Just stupid stuff um, that you can do. Again, post exploitation. How I get access to multiple systems, like domain admins. Do domain admins ever need to log into a member server? No, they don't. So only have your domain admins log into the domain controllers. Then you have a server admin that logs into the servers. Make sense? 
Makes it much easier from a management perspective. Plus, now I don't have a footprint to get to your domain controllers. Not to focus on another exploitation route. Again, simple stuff. Now, here's, the, here's my favorite one. So we, this is testing what you've done. This is what we, we, we think we have, but then when we test it, we fail. My favorite is this. We go and we break into company X. And we add a domain admin, which is supposed to get detected. And we are, they already know that we're in everything. We don't need to add a domain admin, but we're going to anyway. Just to test their instant response, right? So we add this domain admin, and then there's crickets. No one gets alerted. There's no detection. No one knows that domain admin is added. And so we're just sitting there like, just add two more. Add six more. Can we do it from different servers? And all of a sudden, I do it from a different server, and they alert. So the event IDs changed from 2003 to 2008 and 2008 to 2012. Did you know that? So hopefully you're looking at all of those event IDs when you actually add a privilege account and actually testing that. So testing the effectiveness of what you actually have out there and make changes as needed. Um, this is when you start getting into the, the zero-day detection stuff. And I, I use that term loosely because, you know, we're all focused on the APT stuff right now, which is ridiculous. Again, the main way I break in is through default passwords, not your APT crap. Someone's not going to burn a zero-day on you right now. It's not going to happen. I mean, if you're very lucky, then that's cool. I haven't seen it yet. But anyways... Uh, just, just a quick side thing here. Did anybody see the APT1 report? Like the Mandiant video that they made with the, okay. Did that not look like something out of like the early 80s? Like it was supposed to be like this revolutionary way that they're hacking in. It's like literally, it looked like some movie, from like the movie Hackers. Right, without, without all the Hollywood effects. It was like war games plus hackers but with the war game effects. Not to, dip, not, not to say war games, but it's a bad movie. It's a good movie. But that's, that's literally how that, that thing looked. It's not sophisticated. These guys aren't running like the latest and greatest year days and, and running it on you. They're going after other governments and crap like that. So focus on, on, on at least getting the basic stuff first. And then work on isolation of high security zones so your assets that are really important to protect. Things like that. Getting Emmet deployed. You can do Emmet now, which is easy. Uh, level 6. This is when you can start doing covert testing. Congratulations. You graduated level 6. So now you start doing covert testing to see whether or not you, everything that you built in these pr in prior five st steps can actually work. And start focusing on improving your detection capabilities. This is one that only gets the improving uh, portion here. You probably only want to do covert for like one or two years, and then you go back to over testing again. Or do over testing at the same time afterwards. Doesn't make a difference. So wrapping things up, it's not all doom and gloom. Hopefully I'm not up here saying, you know, hey, we all suck, because it's not true. We are getting better. Um, security is getting better. I mean, we, we have more visibility now. Board of directors are mentioning security. It's on the news. I'm on the news, which is crazy. It's weird. Um, you know, you have all these things now. We're getting the right message out there. It's a matter of what we do now to fix it. And the thing is, we're, you know, I look around the room, and we're all pretty young. I mean, granted, Mick is not that old young, or Adrian. Wait, he's an employee. I can't say that. Never mind. Anyways. <laughs> Just kidding. So, <laughs> he's not here, is he? All right, yeah. I had that part up. <laughs> it was just a joke. It was just a joke. I mean... <laughs> But, um, but, you know, you look at that, we, we, are, we, we have the ability now to change things differently, to do things that, that we haven't done in the past. And so a lot of new people coming in, change it, make it different, make it a different approach to something that we haven't done before. It's not the same way because we've been doing things pretty jacked up. And we have to get better. I mean, attacks aren't going to magically stop. Um, they're going to get better and more sophisticated. Again, even though I don't have to use half my stuff that I have, I literally have a folder of stuff that I can't use yet. I'm just waiting. It's like stuff I can't use yet. Whoop-ass is one of those, by the way. But... Um, Technology isn't, isn't, uh, isn't the answer. I mean, again, introducing more and more technology into our environments introduces more complexity. We don't have the amount of people right now to deal with it. And some truths, uh, we are losing the perimeter. Um, so BYOD, cloud, work at home, et cetera, we have to deal with that. It's, it's an evolution that we're going to have to deal with. We, have no longer, we no longer have control over our defensive moats and, and everything else. So build your defenses off of that strategy, knowing that you're going to lose your moats, you're going to lose your perimeters, you're going to lose your castle. So you become decrepit, be some old witch in there and stuff. Um, it's the only one that really matters, um, you know, things like that. Your defense is the only one that matters, um, blah, blah, blah. Uh, can, we, can we stop it all? No. The, the, the thing is that we're never going to be able to stop anything 100%. However, we can detect. Everything that I do is detectable, except like heart bleed, I guess, right? I guess we couldn't detect heart bleed, but anything other than heart bleed, you can pretty much detect, okay? That's a good, that's a good ratio. 99% out of, out of heart bleed is pretty good. Last, last but not least, you know, employ hackers, the good ones. Bring this team inside. We have to have a purple team inside of a company. It's not going to be a third-party consulting thing that you do once a year. You got to hire a company to. You have to hire somebody that's focused on red team and focused on defending, and you work together, and that prioritizes what you're doing from a risk perspective. And so, until we train and train hard to prepare ourselves uh, for offensive capabilities, we cannot have an effective defensive countermeasure. Now, let me ask you a question here: Does the military ever train? 
all the time, right? I was a Marine. I, I, I still am a Marine, sorry. It's, I'm going to get in trouble there. Um, but you look at that, and the, and the Marines train in, air, in, in the entire um, Army, in, in, in Air Force and Coast Guard and Navy and everything else, even though we're the men's department of the Navy. Um, they all train both offensively and defensively. That's what we always do. We always have drills, things that make us better, right? Because when we go into war, do we know what we're doing? Hell yeah, we know what we're doing. We can blow stuff up in two seconds. In IPOSEC, do we know what we're doing? Sometimes. But are we training appropriately? And that's the part, the part we need to start getting better on the defensive things. Now, can, you, can you kill the... So if I, if I understood, can you hear me? Okay, if, you, if I understood your question correctly, there's a seems to be a race between like IT and the complexity that IT is introducing versus what security can actually keep up with, and I, I agree with that. Um, you know, working in a large environment, we saw that all the time. You know, there's new technologies coming out all the time that either support the business or new applications, new infrastructure that's continuously going, and the team is you know the security team is typically you know in what comparison to the IT team, like at best one fifth you know of, of the IT team maybe. And so, yeah, it's very difficult to keep up with everything that's going on in the IT environment and new technologies. I mean, I see it all the time. It's like, you know, Microsoft comes out with, with some new technology, and now I have to be an expert on it in security. It's a very difficult thing um, in environments. But, you know, if you stay core to a lot of the principles, I think a lot of those technologies kind of fall into play. You do your normal assessments, things like that. It's, it's, it's possible to stay ahead. But, I mean, we're quickly, you know, going to that point now where there might be a point of no return where the environment's so complex we don't have the ability to do things. So it's kind of going back behind the stages and fixing things behind the scenes. Um, trying to keep up with it. So I, I don't ever have a good solution for you, but I do think that um, the rapid rate that we're going with technology and keeping up with that makes it very difficult for us to secure things. Completely agree. Any other questions? So apps being verified by formal methods, agree. So um, when you look at application development, and you look at the software development lifecycle, whether it's a third party or whether it's a um, you know a team internally that's developing them. You know, through there, there should be checks that the the the, the SDLC people are champions of their their individual groups are doing for security testing. Um, then through there, there's formal testing that the security team does for source code analysis, dynamic testing of the applications to ensure that the application doesn't actually introduce any new risks. So I completely agree, um, and that actually helps out a lot, um, not just on the software development side, but also any applications that you purchase um, outside of the company or develop internally as solutions. Uh, that you can actually find a lot of those issues ahead of time. So that's, to me, that's one of the core things you should be um, focusing on internally is making sure that you don't introduce any new exposures through applications. Couldn't agree more. Sorry I talked fast. Any other questions? All right, well, thanks for having me. Appreciate it, and uh, talk to you soon.